We're going undercover now to look at a secret industry that's 30 years old. Pirate radio. Is it still king of the airwaves? Find out now in Making Waves. have been hijacking the airways for over 30 years. In that time, the technology has changed from AM to FM and the pirates have moved from ships to tower blocks. As new techniques are developed for broadcasting signals, an ongoing battle has emerged between the pirates and those responsible for policing the airwaves. They change their technologies, we change our technologies. They hide them, we find them, whatever. The DTI have got this new tool for getting our rigs out now. So now at this stage they're uh, one stage ahead of us, you know what I mean? The technology that the pirates do use has, uh, has got better. Pirate radio tends to pick the best ideas from existing broadcast technologies and add ideas of their own for, because of the very special circumstances that pirates operate in. Today, more than 180 pirate radio stations are operating across the UK, upholding a tradition that started in the rough waters of the North Sea with Radio Caroline. Well, this is Radio Caroline on 199 metres, your all-day music station, Britain's first commercial radio station. Caroline was the first pirate to challenge the authorities and went on to shape the future of broadcasting for generations to come. When I, when I think of Radio Caroline, I think the first time that I joined it in July 25th, 1964, I remember going out on the tender boat. We used to go out on a boat from Frinton. Those of us were on Caroline South. And I remember seeing this little boat bobbing up and down on the North Sea and thinking to myself, that is absolutely wonderful. It's such a small little boat. It was very minute, really but it's causing so much problems for the government. And I thought, how wonderful. The government may pronounce soon on the future of radio in Britain. Mr. Wedgwood Benn, the Postmaster General, has already pronounced on the pirates. They're stealing the copyright and paying no money for it. They're playing records that musicians have recorded and giving them no money for it. They're endangering the ship to shore radio, and there's a real risk that distress at sea might not be reported because of the inadequate fumbling handling of equipment. The, the transmitter was 50 kilowatts on the AM band and the reason it was on the AM band is that AM signals can travel a lot further than FM signals. FM signals are really limited to line of sight. As far as you can shine your torch, that's where your signal goes. There was a lot of RF frequency flying around there as well and a, a scare thing went by the, the fact we'd all been made uh, impotent because of this RF frequency uh, that was flying around. And in actual fact on Radio London, when we went, we once went up to 50 kilowatts, I think it was, and the whole mass lit up and uh, it was incredible, it was like a Christmas tree. But you could actually get a fluorescent tube, hold it up, and it would light up itself whilst holding it, holding it in your hand. After more than two decades of successful broadcasting, the Marine Offences Act brought the offshore pirates to their knees and the stations were finally closed down. It's not really um, the thing to do anymore, to transmit um, non-stereo um, AM from a ship offshore. You, you don't get very good coverage, the quality isn't very good. And I think that's why now, if there, there are no offshore pirates, it's not a very viable thing to do. As I said, it's not nice sitting out in the North Sea in the middle of winter. Um, and uh, that's why the pirates are, are, have come on land. Um, the, the music is more specialist-based that they play. Um, it's not the mainstream sort of stuff that perhaps Radio Caroline used to play. Um, and the technology, as I've described, has moved on as well. It's basically the same as music has gone. It's a, it's a parallel, you know. So um, a band now doesn't have to go into um, a recording studio, 48 track, and they don't have to be able to play the guitar, the drums, and everything else. They can just put it all into a computer, and you can do it all in your bedroom. Um, and that's a bit like kind of radio. In the 80s, a whole spectrum of new pirates was born, transmitting from the rooftops of London's tower blocks. These onshore pirates were able to set up studios in their bedrooms. We actually hatched this idea on my bed, in fact, in my old house. We sat around, had this idea for KISS FM. Of course, uh, it's quite well known now, but at the time it was a nebulous idea for, to put a, a, a mixing, a radio station that would actually do mixing on, 
on the air, live on the air, which was a very new thing at the time, and it just seemed like an exciting idea. With FM technology now freely accessible, the airwaves were opened up to a new generation of DIY pirates. You'd need a fairly simple transmitter and the high sight to put it on. Most pirates go for council tower blocks because they're tall, they're relatively unsupervised, and they invariably are in parts of London that are densely populated, which is exactly the, the audience that the pirates need to find. To, in terms of equipment costs, you're talking about perhaps a thousand to fifteen hundred pounds for a good setup to start from scratch to build a pirate radio station. Each time we had to set up a pirate transmitter, it entailed taking uh, several boxes to the top of a very tall building somewhere, such as these. This is a high power amplifier which boosts the uh, transmitter signal and this is a, a receiver which enables you to send the signal from the studio undetected to the transmitter site. But really this was all you needed to set up a, a radio station. It's a lot less than most people would probably expect. This did the job. London's perfectly formed for pipe radio or radio full stop because it's a valley so if, you, if you're transmitting off of sort of Swiss Cottage or around there or um, Alexander Palace or in Crystal Palace and sort of Blackheath then you're at the top of the valley so you just cover everything so it's wonderful. It wasn't long before the Department of Trade and Industry were hot on the pirates' trail, confiscating rigs and raiding studios all over the country. In some weeks, we would uh, maybe get raided three or four times, and each time I would have to build a complete new transmitter and install it. Uh, I wasn't getting much sleep in those days. The problem with being a land-based pirate is that it's very easy for the authorities to track down your transmitter, and they quite frequently will do that and confiscate the equipment. What commenced was a sort of cold war between pirate operators and the Department of Trade and Industry Radio Investigation Department, uh, which did worry me because I'm not a law breaker, but I'd, be, I'd be, be consider myself a bit of a renegade and a, and a bit of a flag waver for um, the music and a uh, champion of the music for the people, so to speak. So that kept me going. The DTI grew ever more sophisticated in tracking illegal signals. The pirates responded by embracing new technologies that would tip the balance back in their favour. The microwave links were one of the big innovations in pirate radio in the early 80s when pirates began to discover that microwaves couldn't be detected by the authorities with their current equipment. The, the main aim was to avoid actually getting caught at the studio. So we would have an intricate system of uh, multiple radio links that join up the studio and the transmitter, in some cases using modified satellite television equipment, uh, dishes, microwave equipment, uh, that was very, very difficult for the authorities to detect, and uh, feed the signal via this method to the transmitter site, which had merely a very cheap, dispensable piece of uh, equipment that would not lead them back to, to us at the studio. We would go for two years without being discovered, and it was normally a lack of studio security that gave us up rather than the technology. Right, we've got a microwave receiver here. It's a low noise block, as, as it's called. And they're very line of sight, these things. They'll only point in straight lines. So this really gives us a clue as to where the studio is. And it would be directly along this line. In this particular case, it's probably coming from the block of flats over there in the distance. Typically, um, we could receive a, it could be receiving a signal up to three miles, even as much as that. It, it makes it more difficult um, because a microwave signal is, um, goes in a very thin beam, if you like, and, and it makes it a little more difficult to track down. And if you have a, a studio which is in, say, a, a, um, a derelict flat in a block of flats, it may be a little more difficult. But the fact is we do have success and we do track them down. As the Cold War continues into the 90s, the DTI is constantly developing new technology to keep the FM dial pirate-free. All the clever stuff's in here. There are a series of aerials mounted into the roof, um, which are phased, and the information from there runs down to a box in the back, and that um, sort of does the clever bit with the electronics and gives us the reading up here. I'm receiving it on the receiver down here, and it's displaying and it's showing me that the, the, the station is coming from almost directly ahead of us at the moment, as you can see. It's flick, it flickering slightly because we're a fair way away from it and we'll have to go and find it. So uh, let's go and see if we can find it. There's always that hint of the unexpected. Of, you know, you're never quite sure what's going to happen. You're never quite sure where it's going to be. You never quite know what new technologies you're going to come up against. And it's terrific to succeed. Um, they, if you like, set you a puzzle and hopefully you've solved it.
what more can you want out of your job? By using the direction finding equipment in the car, it's led us to this point here where we believe, and we can see from the aerial that's on the top of the building, that the chances are that our pirate station is in here. What we'll have to do now is go up, go up in the lift, go up into the lift room and have a look and see what we can find up there. Oh yes, there we go. There we go, typical transmitter, de-locked onto the services so that it can't be removed easily. They come and get our stuff, that's it. At the end of the day, they come and take our stuff. It's not like we're gonna go up there and yeah, start fighting with them and that, you know? They've got a job to do, we respect them for that. They can come and do it, you know? The DTI make over 900 raids a year. All the seized equipment ends up in a storeroom waiting to be destroyed. This is a, a typical pirate radio transmitter that we'll have seized, perhaps probably from a, a tower block somewhere in, in London. Um, it's uh, the sort of transmitter that lots of the pirates use. It's got an aerial output, it's got an audio output probably, and there's a power supply in there as well somewhere. Um, these are the sort of things that we seize a lot of, um, probably several hundred during a year from in London alone. In London there's what I've counted on, on the FM dial, about 20, 27, 28 pirate radio stations, if not more. And when you go on the outskirts, like you go over to West London, the stations double up, so there's so many on, and I suppose they can't concentrate. By the time they hit one station, they go out to the next. By the next weekend, they're back on, so it's like just going round and round, I suppose. There are obviously finances somewhere in the sort of pirate broadcasting area, um, which mean that they can replace the, the transmitters. Um, sometimes they, they replace them the same day, uh, and we, that's why some of the stations, persistent ones, we might take transmitters away from two or three times a week. And it's frustrating, perhaps, for us to think, yes, we've just taken that one off for a nuisance, they're back on again. Um, but that's part of the work, and that's, you know, in, in keeping the airways clean, if you like, um, that's what we, uh, we have to do. We'll be back, you know, we'll, we'll come back, no problem. Staying one step ahead of the DTI is a constant struggle for the pirates. Increasing numbers of raids have forced them to develop new techniques for concealing their rigs. Uh, well, basically, uh, we've just been hit um, by the DTI and I'm just about to plumber the rig back down the pipe. They may hide a transmitter down a ventilation shaft and quite often they'll use um, a device using car jacks to secure them in the ventilation shaft. Um, the transmitter obviously gets put down the pipe um, and this is like a car jack, scissor jack and what we do, um, we lower it down say, I don't know how many feet, about 20 feet and uh, we've got a long tool which goes down on top of this thread here and we do the thread till the jack opens out wide enough and then it locks onto the actual wall of the pipe and the rig is just left held there. What they do, they just but they try winching them out, they put a winch down there with a hook, try pulling them out like that. I know they've got a tool as well where they try and undo the jacks. Um, that's one of the latest tools they've got, I've heard. Well, well they try and keep ahead of us. I've described we, we, we devised something for undoing the car jacks. I've got my way around it, I'm not going to say, but um, basically it's still piping it up, exactly the same, just a little uh, modification around the top end of the jack. Nothing uh, too major, but it will be for them. Yeah, I mean, they've tried to catch up with that and by putting special locks on, on some of the transmitter where they put them to try and stop us. Um, but, you know, there's always a way around it. They have a go at getting it. I'll give them that. They have a good go at it. Uh, but their favourite one, with Rude anyway, is uh, cementing my rigging. What they do, they will uh, put loads of rubbish down the pipe on my rig and cement over it which isn't a problem, I always get it out. If we can't get at the transmitter, there's always got to be power leads and aerial leads coming out, and, and what we might do is to leave it locked in place and just cut the leads. 
that's all it takes. As soon as you know how they're getting it, there's always a way around things, you know what I mean? It's just a case of uh, going up there, putting new aerials up, just join the aerials on, you can be back on within hour and a half, hour, if all the aerials are done. Flick the switch and we're on air. just the DTI who are out to stop the pirates. Local councils spend thousands of pounds every year trying to secure their rooftops. Um, yeah, there is certain blocks that do have uh, one-off like locks or where they've got problems with pirates. They put a special door up there to uh, stop them getting up there sort of thing. Well, besides the um, metal grids that we've installed along the perimeters, We've also um, upgraded the doors to the entry to the roof areas and the lift motor rooms. There are pirates that if they're like, they've been on a block for a while and their roof gets secured up, they will get a oxycetylene set and cut their own hole through their uh, door um, or a grinder, etc., whatever. We decided to increase the measures and we installed a silent alarm system. Hello, Mr. Williamson? Yeah, it's London Borough Falcon Forest. I've got an intruder door alarm at All Saints Tower. You have a door, door alarm like you would at home. If someone opens the door illegally, then the alarm will go off. And the other type is the passive type, the ones where it's an infrared beam. And if anyone cuts that beam, then the alarm will go off. We will know there's intruders up there or something's moving up there and we can initiate the necessary call out. As the war of attrition drags on, the pirates are beginning to explore new forms of media. If the DJI ever do decide to shut down the FM dial in whatever dramatic way they decide to do it, there's the internet for the DJs to go, like there's certain internet stations out there at the moment that people go, the DJs go and play, they pay £20 and they're broadcasted all around the world on the internet, you know. All they need are a pair of decks, a lead from the mixer into the back of a PC and away you go. Sons of the Pirates, coming at ya, live and direct. Interface is at the forefront of a new revolution in pirate radio. It's as simple as having a, uh, a PC, a 486 PC would do it, and just downloading a, a simple plugin that takes about five minutes off the website. Um, it's a real simple job, very, very simple, and it's getting a lot easier and easier and easier as we go along. So that's Interface Pirate Radio with a style. Well, it was actually emailed, um, I think it was the Christmas just gone, um, by these guys that were travelling around in a nuclear submarine. And they, they took that signal and parked it around the whole sub while I was eating their Christmas din-dins, etc. And they actually had it going for about two days before they actually got told to pull, pull it off by one of their commanders. Oh, no, no, that part radio stuff. Don't forget where to look. With a www.pirate-radio.co.uk The Pirates out of London. We're usually sustaining about between four and 8,000 people simultaneously. The hit rate is into the millions. Today's internet pirates, like those who operated offshore in the 60s, are not illegally broadcasting, but they are infringing copyright laws. People like Interface are hosting music for free on their websites, and anybody can log on there and actually enjoy the music without actually the, the, the owner of the copyright being paid for it. And so what it's doing is it's encouraging this, this culture of, of music being very free and uh, the producers and the artists that have spent a lot of time and money in, in creating that music aren't getting anything back for it by, you know, with this sort of usage. We certainly don't get any negative feedback from, from the artists. The, you know, the record industry is, is, an, is an, another matter. They're not particularly impressed, but that's just because they're frightened to death of the internet. Big up the brushes on the Oklahoma massive. 
At the moment, pirates are exploiting the unregulated potential of the internet, leaving the music industry in mild panic as they try to catch up with this new breed of pirates. Really, the technologists and the copyright owners are starting to come together a bit more. So I think that in the near future, we'll actually see um, technologies up there on the internet, which, which not only acknowledge the rights of the copyright owner, but you know, may in fact remunerate them as well. The actual spirit hasn't changed. All it's changed is the technology, as it always does. I mean, all I've done is follow the technology, natural progression, from tower blocks to then the internet. I mean, it's just a natural thing, what comes next. The technologies of the past once helped the pirates stay one step ahead of the DTI. But ironically, the technologies of the future may leave the pirates behind. The future may be more difficult for pirates as digital broadcasting comes in because um, the, the uh, um, digital broadcasting will be arranged differently and the programs will be carried on what's called a multiplex so one frequency will carry several different stations and the, the people who run the multiplexes clearly won't take pirates on their frequency. I think that's when pirate radio is going to suffer when uh, the digital radio comes in. I don't know what's going to happen then. Uh, Obviously, people will get round it. There probably will be a couple of pirates pop up, but um, I can see a lot of people moving onto the internet or cable or some other form of uh, way of playing the music. There will always be, I think, a hardcore of pirates around, but um, as um, digital radio comes into its own, digital audio broadcasting comes into its own, I don't think the pirates will have the facility or the ability to deal with that sort of technology. In the future, people will laugh at, at the way pe that we had to go out to tower blocks to, to get music out to the people who wanted to listen to it. It will be like the aliens and their mashed up potatoes. As we enter the new millennium, a fifth generation of pirates are continuing the work that began in the 1960s. They'll have to continue to embrace new technologies to survive and find ever more intricate ways of broadcasting their music to their listeners. It's a way of life for me now. I've been doing it for so long. It's hard getting... I, have, I must admit, I, I was going to uh, stop a while ago, but I'm just so used to doing it now. Every, it's an everyday thing, you know what I mean? It's part of my life now. I'm just... It's like a drug, basically. I'm addicted to it now. Well, part for me is it's about being real. It's about not pre-planning anything. It's about people coming and playing from in here rather than out the pocket or out there. It's not something that's thought about. It's something that gets talent, um, fresh talent. I can't see the pirate uh, radio station as a, as a bugbear going away, to be honest with you, because um, they're too nimble, too thrifty, um, too underground and too intelligent to, to get caught out like that. Every weekend you've got to come on air, got to do the radio. People are out there, they want to hear the radio, you've got to be there for the people. So basically, yeah, that's why we do the radio. I came in doing pirate radio and on a piratical wavelength, and I, my last broadcast ever, when I don't no longer want to be legal, uh, will be a pirate one, yeah. This is Pick the Pilot Week here on Discovery, and you've been watching Making Waves. If you liked it, ring 0181 242 6410 now. Calls are charged at a standard rate, and your call could mean that this programme gets made into a series. And don't forget, you can vote for as many programmes as you like, so give us a call.